we really want to be able to ensure that we are designing our businesses and that we understand that it's not something that happens once the design of our business is a continual process episode 66 hello and welcome my name is ryan willard and i am the host of the business of architecture uk and welcome to this week's episode and i thought that i would give you a little treat i don't know if it's a treat as such because you get to hear from me and i haven't done any content for a little while and i recently did a webinar on friday evening which i absolutely love doing and i called it fail forward fail fast 10 of my business calamities and the alchemy of applying iterative design to an architecture business so a little bit of a mouthful there but the what I've included in this week's podcast is just a small segment of the webinar the webinar was about two and a half hours long so there was a lot of content in there and one of the ideas for me that I think is the most I mean personally this is what I really really love is this idea of iterative design. So as architects, we're very good at doing designs where there's a kind of circular process where we refine things, we test things, we look for feedback from clients, from planners, from um, you know other sorts of external groups, from physical constraints. And that kind of informs the way that our buildings emerge and appear. And this idea, we can apply that to our businesses except in business when we kind of get a bit of feedback it can feel like a failure so you know when you get a knock or when something happens in our business it might be poor cash flow losing a client an idea doesn't work particularly in marketing um, marketing and sales there's a lot of rejection involved there's a lot of things that just don't work Um, and that can be incredibly frustrating and it has real impact into a business but being able to step back give ourselves some altitude, be the architects that we are and architect our own business by looking at it as an iterative design process that's continually evolving, we can find a lot of freedom in that and we can start to really design businesses that are innovative, fulfilling, that are going to take us where we want to go in life. So, it's about 25 minutes long. The sound quality isn't as beautiful and as rich as this microphone setup that I'm speaking to you on now. It's a little bit thin, but it's still really good. And I do refer to some images. So I'm talking over a set of slides. And if you want to see the images in the slides, jump onto YouTube. Um, I'll be pinning the video up there as well. Or you can just go onto the website, www.businessofarchitecture.co.uk. So sit back and relax. And here am I. So let's get to it. Foul forward, foul fast. 10 of my business calamities and the alchemy of applying iterative design to an architecture business. So where does this mantra come from? Fail fast, fail forward, fail often, fail better. This is, if you know, if you're in the US and uh, from Silicon Valley, these are the kinds of mantras that you hear innovative entrepreneurs talk about it's this idea of developing an idea quickly testing it in the marketplace understanding what's working what's not working what's failing and kind of continually refining and improving um, the product the app the technology that's being developed of course Thomas Edison very famously um, I think he went through maybe 10,000 iterations before he got the light bulb actually working. And it's one of these incredible testaments to human will and to focus and to understanding and learning incrementally from mistakes or things that are not working and keep adding to it. And this idea of of being circular, because when we're in the circle of iteration and doing things, it can feel like you're spinning your wheels. But as long as there is awareness there of what's happening and there is no kind of personal make wrong and frustration, these are the things that get in the way. It's a lot of a lot of it's kind of internal mental stuff. Um, and it takes a, a, an intense degree of focus to be able to continue on the iterative path. And as architects, we are already well trained in that iterative process. So 
I think, and I've spoken to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people, particularly in the tech industry, who marvel at the systems thinking, the iterative design processes that architects embody in their work and can bring to a project. And often it's those kinds of creative synthesizing skills and persistence that work very, very well in business. So we really want to be able to ensure that we are designing our businesses and that we understand that it's not something that happens once. The design of our business is a continual process and there will be mistakes that are involved and often the mistakes in business can be things like poor cash flow, losing a client, having arguments with staff, losing staff, um, it might look like disagreements among partners, all of this kind of stuff. This is just the this is just what happens in business. And when these things start to happen, it's pointing us in the direction of our businesses need to be re redesigned. So this is very much what this tonight is all about. Um, you know, the, again, Nicholas Tesla, these are kind of, you know, quotes that are signaling the virtues of failure. And of course, that's quite a common theme with many great performers, people of uh, notable uh, experience, um, people who have developed incredible things, all talk about this process of failure. So I really want us to love failure. I want us to embrace it. I want us to be interested in it. I want us to be listening deeply to our failures, our mistakes, celebrating them, sharing them. And also part of this is about the importance of being able to share our mistakes as an industry is incredibly important for everybody because I know many architects do not like to talk about the business failures and do not like to talk about marketing failures or sales failures or competition losses and you know it's that's just natural we we want to be able to portray our best selves our best version of what it is that we're doing we want to, we don't want to talk about the times that we fell out with clients and we lost clients or we nearly got sued or we did get sued or a business went bankrupt or the arb kicked your ass and fined you for something because you were in breach of your professional code of conduct I've had the opportunity to speak to so many architects around the world and there are so many varied stories, incidences, things that people have been dealing with in their businesses um, and there's no right or wrong and it's, and it's part of the living organism of a business. And so the intelligence here is to be able to always recognize that we're in a process of iteration, we're in a process of uh, of of continual learning we're in a process of feedback so that dictum of fail forward fail fast fail better is wonderful however it does become a kind of shallow dictum that in practice practice becomes very difficult because there is a psychological hurt there is an emotional hurt that comes with failing there is humiliation there is the worry and the fear of what other people will think um, there is the self-judgment about failing there is the internal criticisms there is the criticisms of staff and there is a mistake made our entire school system in the western world most definitely is geared towards not making mistakes we are trained to get examined and to learn things, to take tests on things. And by making a mistake, that is deemed a failure. That is deemed like a closed door um, to progress into the next level. It is a systemic thing that our education is based on. Now, there are, um, there are benefits to having a system that is structured like that and it is useful, uh, but in terms of personally, you know, definitely personal development and also the ability to be able to discover and particular in, in entrepreneurship, in creativity, uh, you need to be able to make the mistake. You need to be able to have the confidence to, to swing out and try something different. We know this as designers. We know this as designers. We know that when we're um, 
you know, when we're sketching, when we're drawing, that often the hand, the physical movement of sketching and drawing, we accidentally do things. Or perhaps we're making a model and we put a box somewhere else. Um, you know, you cut something in the wrong way and you think, ah, actually, that's interesting. These mistakes become leaps forward in innovation, in thought, in creativity. Um, and we don't see them as failures. We see them as part of a process. But in business, all too often we see failure as something meaning that you are or I am of a defective self. And I like these quotes from Tanya Cohen. If I make a mistake, if I fail, how does that affect who I am? How does other people see me? It's very deeply interwoven into our identity, the fear of failure. We do not want to be seen as somebody who has made a mess, who has bollocked things up to use an English expression, we are very, very cautious of making mistakes. But in business, it's imperative that we make mistakes. And more than making the mistake, it's imperative that we're able to learn from the mistake. And often, I want to reframe the idea of a mistake. I want to reframe the idea of failing. And often, we set ourselves to get to um, result X, for example, and maybe there's 10 steps to getting to result X. And now we don't necessarily know how many steps there are to getting to result X. And we do step one, step two, step three, and we feel like a failure because we're calling step three a failure. And in reality, all it is is that there's 10 steps and that we're on step three. So and I want to keep relating this back to the design process because design thinking, architectural design thinking is incredibly powerful. And it is quite remarkable to me that many architects are superb, brilliant organizational thinkers in terms of space. But when it comes to organizing and systematizing and designing their businesses, we often neglect this. And here is in the biggest asset we have as architects is being able to design our own businesses and to be able to move into whatever kinds of disciplines, industries that we want to do. There's a, there's a tremendous possibility that comes from designing our own businesses. So this is a diagram that I use uh, <laughs> I often use this for my it depends who I'm speaking to, right? So I use this for my clients. When I say to my client, an, an architecture client, I say, I don't say the reality of design. I call it, um, you don't want this. This is what happens if you use someone who's not a professional, right? It, if you try and do the design work yourself, you'll be looping around, you'll be going back and forth, you'll be making mistakes, it's a disaster, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. If you use an architect, here's what happens. A, B, C, D, bang, you get your result. Now. And also when we're at students, OK, when we're students, the design process of putting together your project goes round. There's weeks where you're not doing anything. There's like you go down one path and you've tried something else out. It doesn't work. And then you go back onto something else and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when we present it as a portfolio, we present this. So I, so I actually call this the reality of design. So as you can see here, this is a looping circular process. I'm just gonna quick, quickly do this. Do this so I do want to see people. Okay, good. Um, you know, this is a circular looping iterative process where we're revisiting certain ideas. It sometimes it looks like we're back in the same position, but that's design. That is the nature of designing and that is works to our benefit. Um, but, you know, when we when we present our ideas, say, particularly end of the year or as a portfolio, we present it like this in this linear fashion. So it's just important to make the distinction between the reality and the way that we communicate, the way that we've um, come out with ideas and designs. Let me just quickly check what that knocking was because I don't want it to be somebody who is... Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, good. You know, we we often talk about this linear process. So we want to be aware that the linear process from A to B to C is an illusion. It's not real. It's just how we communicate the complexity and the reality of design. Okay. So it's the same with business. 
we have an illusion that business goes from A, B, C, and D. And there you go, you've got a, you've got a result and you've got something uh, very simple. And this is the reality of business. Business is like design, it's iterative. You are allowed, one of the beauties of running a small business is that you're allowed to pivot, you're allowed to change direction, you're allowed to change building typology, you're allowed to experiment, you're allowed to speculate about what architecture could be, you're allowed to go into different disciplines, as long as you can find a market need for something and it's able to produce income, or it doesn't even need to produce income necessarily, because you can find something else that produces income and it allows you to do research over here. There are so many different ways that you can set up your business model to fulfill on what's important to you. It's amazing. But we want to be aware of this iterative design process because this iterative design process is at the heart of it. It's at the heart of how we design our buildings, how we work with our clients. And when we start applying it to our own businesses, it begins to really unlock a lot of power. This is another little funny sketch I saw somebody post on Facebook the other day. The what I planned and the what happened and this kind of squiggly mess of a line. Now, as architects, we know that we need to plan. You know when you do anything of uh, what you, that you're trying to accomplish or achieve, that planning is essential because it gives you a focus. You start thinking about it. You start trying to reverse engineering the solution to figure out how it works. And a plan without planning, you will you won't even get an arrow that's going you know in that kind of in the, in the right direction. You'll just get nothing. You'll just be skidding and spinning around nothing. But when we've got a plan and we've got an idea, a vision in our heads of where we're going, there's like a north star, there's a compass point um, that kind of anchors down the chaos of the iterative process. So. Again, I want us to be thinking about that, about the importance of actually having a plan and working your plan and revising your plan, because actually your plan needs to be an iterative design process as well. OK, so everything has got this looping, circular, causal feedback mechanism inbuilt into it. And I could talk for hours and hours and hours about those kind of iterative feedback loops um, but I will spare you on this particular webinar but we, it is very very important and it's a very deep way of thinking and an innovative way of thinking about um, common problems in our lives in our designs in our business so this idea of planning and reverse engineering that's kind of thinking about where do I want to be in 10 years time what do I want to be doing what kinds of projects do I want to be looking at? And then figuring out, okay, if I want to be doing hospital projects, who's going to be commissioned? Where would that project have come, come from? What kind of conversations would I have had to have? How many conversations would I have had? How would those conversations have come about? How did I get introduced to that person? How many times did I get someone say no to me? What kind of statistics are involved in that, in the probability of doing that? Just thinking that through in the mind first, kind of starts giving you a clear vision, a clear plan, and then you can start taking action on that plan and there will be this cyclical process. Sometimes, and this is very much what I've done in my business, which is how I kind of uh, convince myself that what I've done is okay, uh, is when you're running a business that there are sort of emergent strategies. And I'll come to that in just a second. But as I said, it is very akin to this design process that we go through with our projects and with the organization of complex buildings. Um, this is some a bit of eye candy, some visual vitamins because we like buildings. And this is Sfer Fen. I love Sfer Fen. He's a Norwegian architect. Beautiful, beautiful. This is, this is one of these buildings in Haymar that just sort of blew my mind when I went to see it. It's an old agricultural site, agricultural museum um, with some really interesting sort of incisions and it's always beautifully photographed. And again, this process of drawing, of sketching out ideas, we know that these plans, that these sketches, this is a, there'll be a sketchbook filled with these little ideas of just trying them out again and again and again before it comes, you know, before it appears as these beautiful 
interesting organizational plans and of course before it ever gets anywhere near to its built form it's gone through this iterative process and when we start thinking about iterative processes as well when we're doing simultaneous projects as well there is a blending of different iterations um, Peter Salter recently completed this building warmer yard in the UK again famous for his beautiful hand-drawn sketches I like hand-drawn sketches I like using the analogy of sketching by hand because the hand communicates things to us that we're not always aware of the hand will often um, jump to solutions without us realizing without us consciously thinking about it when you're a confident um, drafts person or sketcher with freehand illustrations um, there's a speed to the line that often produces happy accidents um, interesting things happen this is kind of as architects we're good at nurturing creativity we're really good at being able to um cultivate creativity in these kinds of you know through these disciplines and the way that we think about organizing space and we realize that we've got to fight and massage and do it again and again and again and that's the joy and that's the joy of it it's the real enjoyment that comes from designing so bringing that to our businesses I interviewed Tom Kundig recently um, from Olsen Kundig. Uh, I mean, that was just so inspiring speaking to him. And this is a nice little illustration of how a project will go from sketch ideas, various organizational ideas, and then get slowly more refined and more detailed. And, you know, there'll be a looping back of the process. We don't often get to see all of the workings of architects. Okay, and again, just go back to that idea of the myth, the myth, and the reality. Okay, so when we see when we see buildings and projects put into books and things like that, there's always a kind of structure to it because obviously you need to be able to read with some sort of logical sense. But the reality of it of it of us of um quite often is a very circular design process. So these are some. You know, if you just Google iterative design process or iteration, lots of different industries talk about it. Lots of different industries um, discuss it. Architects, in my mind, um, are the best. I was I saw a quote the other day from Tim Brown of IDEO in Palo Alto, um, who talks about design thinking and applying that to organizations. He was saying that architecture is the best form of systems design. Studying architecture is the best form of systems design period there is nothing there is not any other subject that comes close to it um and i could talk again i could talk for hours about how exciting it is how exciting the tech industry finds the skills of the architect um you know the tech industry is pinching our word they're pinching they're calling people software architects all these other industries financial architects rubbish you're not an architect that is an important word to use because it really does illustrate and you know it's a very unique process it's not always just about designing buildings so you know for me architecture is a way of looking it's a process it's a process thing and it's this idea of iterative design so again these are just some interesting diagrams about iteration iterative design this was and uh, this was some sort of diagram that was talking about um levels of you know consciousness or something like that on the right there is a diagram used by user interface designer talking about the iterations of designs that are needed to produce you know workable solutions for app interfaces this is a bit more product design and you know you've got loops within loops but again you've got this same kind of feedback mechanism and i'm going to simply communicate the power of iterative design with the Ouroboros, an old medieval symbol of a snake eating its own tail. The self-generating snake eating its own tail. This is very much embodies this idea of iteration, of looping, of feedback, of doing things again and again with continual regeneration and growth and refinement and improvement. Now, we could go really deep into this in terms of where this idea of looping and iteration appears in lots of different cultures and lots of different disciplines um, of regeneration lots of religious texts talk about it it's really really fascinating um, but for now let's use the snake the ouroboros and just think about iterative design in that process now 
part of iteration I was talking about earlier the kind of idea of accidental sketches being the things that inform our architecture and our buildings the unintended patterns that kind of suddenly create something new and exciting now in business that idea is called emergent strategies this is a way that actually a business idea you don't know what the business is going to be when you start out but you engage actively in this iterative process of taking a hypothesis an idea about a product or a service and you take it to the market and the market gives you feedback and you refine it and this process goes around and around and around and around to something emerges that you were not expecting for example a great example of this actually was um this was not necessarily an iterative process in terms of market feedback but it was an iterative process in terms of designing and celebrating failures so 3m one of the technicians, the chemists, whoever it was at 3M, was trying to create a aeronautical glue, like a super strength glue that would be able to repair aircraft that were coming back from the military at great speed. Um, I may have got this wrong, but this is the kind of what I understand to be the idea of behind it. It was, it was a product that was in development to create a super strength glue. And for whatever reasons, it didn't work. And he, he developed a glue that was very weak, that was quite tacky. Now, when you're engaged and you're celebrating the Ouroboros, you're celebrating iterative design, your brain is open. Your brain will have leaps of intuition, of innovation, and you will think differently about things. And that was the beginning of post-it notes. That was how post-it notes were developed through an accident. So bear that in mind with how we apply that to an architecture business, because I also want us to think about architecture as a service, not just in terms of buildings, but also in terms of education, in terms of teaching. Um, you want to be thinking about how this iterative process can be used to communicate your ideas, how to market, how to test out um, business strategies or test out advertising or test out modes of communicating to uh, a marketplace this is very very useful to be kind of considering now the oblique strategies is a deliberate method of encouraging these kinds of happy accidents um, brian eno if any of you know is a very famous producer produced people like David Bowie, U2, all sorts of incredible albums that he's been involved in. And he would often have a process of in the recording studio when things were getting a little bit dry or they were getting a bit boring or they were getting stagnant that he produced this set of cards called the oblique strategies. And these cards would have a kind of a dilemma written on them like distorting time how would you have done it? Be dirty, emphasize differences. They're not kind of defining statements in any way or orders. Um, they're just kind of these interesting dilemmas that you want to try and engage with. And again, it was this way of deliberately introducing a form of feedback or a way of kind of, rather than just going around and around and around in a circle, we want that kind of spiraling effect. You want that spiraling of refinement. So this was a way of kind of instigating creativity, of designing in happy accidents and mistakes. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you.